Hello everyone, greetings from my home office and welcome to Adams. It is tutorial time. It's time to get our hands dirty and finally see some Python. I would like to start this session with some considerations on tooling infrastructure to help get you started. And thereafter, we will dive straight into our first exercises that are already waiting for you on GitHub. As I was saying earlier, there are two fundamental routes that you could take in order to follow the tutorials. You either ready your own computer, uh, installing Python and everything else that is needed so that you can run all the exercises on your own machine. The other option is to use a cloud-based platform. And here I would recommend Google Colab simply because I know it and use it where basically you can start right away with Python programming. You do not need to install anything on your machine and therefore you will have a very easy start. All you need to do that is a Google account, which you would need to create, and then you can start using Colab. So the decision which option to take is on you. If you are, let's say, enthusiastic about data analytics and want to do some more in that field, I would strongly recommend that you configure everything on your own machine so that you have the full flexibility, also in terms of which tools you involve. If your objective is mainly to finish this course for now and then see whether you want to do some more or not, maybe the easier option for you is to use Google Colab. Again, choice is yours. Let's get started. And uh, first of all, I'll briefly introduce Colab. Should you already be familiar with, with Python, have seen notebooks, etc., and have already made your choice how to deal with the exercises, feel very free to skip that part, okay? So let's see. Right, let's assume you have not done any Python programming before, you're entirely new to the field, and first of all, want to experience the language a little bit without too much overhead in terms of installing software, etc. cetera. Uh, as I said, the easiest way, you open your web browser and navigate yourself to Google Colab. Google Colab, that stands for Collaboratory. It's an environment where you can do Python programming and where then your code is executed behind the scenes on Google Cluster's computer, which is very, very useful for us. Um, that should bring me right to the spot. There we go. Google Colab, that's the first entry, unsurprisingly, because I'm using Google search engine. And the URL I have highlighted that in Moodle as well, I think, is colab.research.google.com. Pause for effect. My internet is not too fast this morning. There we are. So we are presented some nice welcoming screen. And um, here you can select between a bunch of, of files, let's say. The top one of which should be welcome to collaboratory. That's a type of intro notebook that Google has made available for you if you're interested in this tool. And I'd really recommend you have a look into that before you start with our tutorials. It's really a nice intro tutorial here. Right, there we are. So we are obviously in a browser type of window. We have some table of contents here, an outline of our file, so to say. Here's our main window with our content. And the reason that works is that I have my Google account and have previously used Colab. You might experience some extra steps that you need to take before you get here. If you're really new to the field, I can't really simulate that, I believe. Um, but I trust you'll, you'll, find your to here. You, you'll find your way to here. Let me click this. Uh, let me close this table of contents here. We don't really need it right now. Let me tell you a little bit about notebooks. A notebook is very common in the Python world, and it's a type of mix between text and code and results 
of running the code and the results the code is going to produce, say uh, visualization, say graphs. You might write some code to produce a nice graph, do a nice analysis, then produce a nice graph to report the results of your analysis and you write some explanation. All that together can nicely be packed into one notebook. That's a bit uncommon if you have done programming before, but uh, have used, let's say, a programming language like Java. Maybe in your undergraduate, you've taken my Java course, or presumably you have taken business analytics. Their things were also slightly different. These notebooks are super popular in the Python world, and they are great for didactic purposes. If you want to demonstrate something, then the notebook is beautiful because you have this mix between coding, how you do something, text, explanation, why you do it and what you're doing, and results plus their interpretation. That's wonderful. It's not what you would use to write production level code. So it's, it's not what companies who use Python in their day-to-day -day operations would use. They would not use notebooks. For us, it's the mechanism of choice because we are um, operating in a university setting. We are trying to learn things and then these notebooks are exactly what we want to, what we want to use. Let's have a quick look at that. Um, what you see right away here is that we have a bunch of explanations, some welcoming explanation what collaboratory is about. You see these little arrows here, so apparently you have the opportunity to structure your text into chapters and sub-chapters and can open and close these sub-chapters sub here. There we are. And then there is this little gray bit here, which actually is a coding cell. So a notebook is a sequence between content and code cell. And the cell is nothing but a block. It's just a block where you write some content, some explanation, maybe together with a header. And then you have a block where you write your code. And after the code, there is a block which produces you some results. That's a little bit uh, that you see right here at the minute. This 86,400 uh, is a result of this piece of code here. A computation where you just work out the number of seconds in a day. Note these little commands here. Uh, they allow you to add another code cell or another text cell where you can then write some explanation. And you can click all these cells to edit them. For instance, if you want to change with the explanation here, getting started, you could double click it or you could press enter. And then you're presented an edit mode. That's specific to Google Colab. Other tools will behave a little differently. Here I have this pane split in the left part where I write my text and a right part where I see how that text is formatted. We're using a language here that is called markup language. Essentially, that is text. And there can be some style sheets attached to the text to make it look nice. For example, which font type is used. And also we can use some very rudimentary formatting commands. Note this double star here, Colab Notebook. This double star indicates that you want a text appear in bold. Let's add a bit to that. So welcome class to our, and I wanna highlight that this is the first tutorial. So I just type the double star first. Adam's, oops, tutorial. And then it takes a little while and eventually you see this text appearing nicely formatted in the right hand of the window, in the right hand side of the window. There are some more formatting commands. You can use the single star uh, like this to make something italic. And a little bit more you can do like bullet lists or enumerated lists proper lists. If you are interested, I suggest you just run a web search for markup formatting and you'll get some results that inform you which commands or which symbols you can use here. Uh, one more really important one would be the hashtag. You see that 
in the upper part getting started the hashtag indicates a header and if you have two hashtags that's the header of the second hierarchical level that allows you to structure your document so let's say we want to add another header but of the third level so we just could enter three hashtags here this is a third level header there we are and this way you can organize your document just as you would organize a seminar thesis let's say or a dissertation one more bit a nice feature about uh, notebooks and this this markup is that it allows you to use latex commands if you want to write some equations then you can easily use or integrate some LaTeX here. For example, for inline equations, I just use the, the dollar. Uh, this is an equation. And then put something like y equals x top w. Sorry about that. Oops, and of course I, oh dear. So now, finally, this is what I wanted to show. So now you have a nice equation here, properly formatted, nicely presented using LaTeX. So notebooks are also very good if you need to explain some formalism and have a lot of equations that you want to show your readers. Use LaTeX for that purpose. It works well, like a charm, as we've seen. Okay, that was the markup bit, and um, the other type of cell that you already see here is the coding cell. That's actually some Python commands that we have here. We declare a variable called seconds in a day, and then define what's going to be stored in that variable, and the result apparently is some computation here, where we just do some, some arithmetics. And by default, if you just type in the name of the variable, as you see it here in the second line, that variable will get evaluated and the result what is currently stored in the variable will be reported to you so if i run this cell either by clicking play or by using my shortcut command shift and enter ah, you see it's not really slow today that little circle here indicates that the command is currently executed I'm not quite sure why it is so slow. Um, that is not the normal behavior. If that were the normal behavior, it would take that long to work out the number of seconds in a day. Obviously, Kula would not be very useful. That's not quite representative. But then here, finally, we have our results. And if we change that, uh, do some more computations, let's say seconds in a day times seven, and we equate that to second, seconds in a week okay and we run that again this type of command this or this type of code does not produce any output so there is no output presented to me but i could now either just as before state the name of the variable to get it um, printed out or what i personally think is a better way to do it to use the function print uh, guess what it does? It will just print me the name of a variable. And then we have the number of uh, seconds in a week. And should you have ever wondered, that happens to be 604,800 seconds per week. Wonderful. And now you can work out for yourself how many seconds we already spent in our home offices. Okay, um, that was the basics. Um, feel free to, and you should really follow along this tutorial a little further. There are, well, here is a steep learning curve, right? So the next part really goes right into data science, uses some, some libraries. I will stop here because I will uh, very soon jump to my own tutorials where we start a little slower. But this welcome to collaboratory collaboratory i highly recommend that you that you go through it to have a look and also um, because it's it's just nice 
if you go back to the starting page, sorry for that, Here we go. There is a tutorial that I like a lot, which is uh, charts in Collaboratory. To be honest, this has nothing, is not really specific about Collaboratory. It's just how to do charts in Python using a bunch of libraries. And if we click that and have a look at this tutorial, Look here, so uh, just by the outline, we have a line plots, bar plots, we've got histograms, scatter plots, stack plots, pie charts, all you wanna have, some cool 3D charts, and then there are some alternative libraries. You see the Seaborn here, that's called matplotlib. Essentially, when you work with Python and Jupyter Notebooks, you have access to a bunch of charting tools or charting libraries, functions that allow you to create charts. Matplotlib is a very popular one. We will largely focus on that. Seaborn, what you see down here, is another very popular one for data science type of plots. Many of the standard plots that we need, histograms, box plots, etc. You can easily do these with Seaborn, but you could, well, as easily do them with Matplotlib. Plotly, the others there also, all of these are popular. Um, and just by browsing through this tutorial, starting from very simple plot, some histograms, cumulative histograms, some scatter plots here. It's a bit slow, probably because of the video recording that's running in the background. If you go through that, uh, you should experience it a lot quicker, I hope. Then eventually, once we go down, we get some nice 3D charts, right? So that looks pretty cool. Or look at this one here. Very nice chart, very sophisticated, right? So we could try to plot some error surface of a neural network. Um, that looks pretty amazing already. And then here's some standard functionality of the Seaborn library. Um, look at that. We have this regression plot here. We have some tube around our regression line, which could indicate something like confidence. And for now, what... Um, you can note is that doing these charts, if you know how to do it, uh, look at that. That's not a great deal of code that you need to write. It's pretty straightforward. You basically just see these three import lines. Your import means I'm using some pre-existing functionality. I'm loading some libraries, very much like loading an R package. And everything that starts with a, with a hashtag in a coding block that's basically just a comment, so no code, just explanation. And then you see how this amount of code that you need is, is very, very little, in fact. You define a variable x and you define a variable y, which, if you look closely, will depend somehow on x. And um, then you basically say rec plot. That's the single piece of code that really does 95% of the work, rec plot. And then you get this nice, beautiful graph of x versus y, or y versus x. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So uh, that's maybe the take home here. Python gives you great ways to do visuals, appealing graphs, and you don't need to write a lot of code to get these. It's probably even easier than using ggplot2 in R, I believe. All right, um, feel free to browse through that notebook as well. But uh, for now, I want to stop here because we also did some tutorials for you and I think it's about time to have a look at these. So now that we have seen Google Colab and made some very first contact with that tool, let's take another step and try to examine the exercises that are part of Adams. I have opened our Moodle page and uh, by the way, once this tutorial is online, if you have looked at Moodle before and also the GitHub repository, I've done some changes just today. So please don't be confused that things might look a little bit different if you have explored them before. 
This is our Moodle page, which you should know pretty well, so let's scroll down a little bit and find our way to the tutorial materials. Lectures, and here we are. As I said before, my idea is that I share the tutorial codes with you using GitHub, which I hope you will uh, basically also explore a little bit during the course. To be honest, you can minimize your, your working with GitHub if you want to. It's really not needed to make use of it, but I invite you to familiarize yourself a little bit with that. It's very useful, it's very popular as well, and if you envision a career in data science, you want to leave a note in your CV that you are um, well capable to use GitHub. So take it as an, as an opportunity. And you will find the link right here to our GitHub repository, which is basically the place where I will share everything with you that you need for the tutorial part. So let's click this link here. And it should bring you to our repo. It's part of the Humboldt-WI Business Informatic in German Wirtschaftsinformatik repository. And here we are in the folder Adams, which is the one that's most interesting for you. So, as I said, this looks a lot different from what it looked yesterday uh, or the day before. So, I basically took out a lot of material that was premature, and my plan is to share materials with you once I'm done with them. And some of you might uh, not like that too much, and some of you might just to uh, jump ahead, work, you know, a bit more, or they are already more familiar with programming, want to work um, ahead of a course, that is fine. Uh, you can easily do that. All the raw materials, which I'm yet editing for the course, are available in my own repository. If you look at this repo file here, and by the way, I noted that the font is sometimes very hard to read in the video especially the previous programming code. So I will make sure that this improves from now on. Let's zoom in a little bit. Here, for instance, um, you see a link to my own repository. So my GitHub account is just Stefan Lefman. Should you click that and then eventually find your way to my GitHub account, you know, these are all my, my commits. Uh, what might be the quickest way to get there? Um, maybe just going Humboldt, WI, and on this you have a list of the members of all the people, and here is me. There we are. Um, yeah, I was a lot younger by then. Uh, this is my repository. It's quite um, scarcely populated, but you have a repository Adams. That's my own one, which is like a shadow copy of what you see in the official one. And only if you want to work ahead, only then you can have a look in the Adams files here, where you have full access to all the exercises that we used in the past when Johannes and Alisa was giving the tutorial in the last year. So um, note that much of what you find here may change for this year or, or not so much. I'm working on that right now. This is only if you want to work ahead of the course. Okay, back to the rest of us. This is the official repository. What you find here is an immature final state and should not change unless you point me to an error. You have all the codes that I was using as part of the lectures and you have the exercise part right here. And if you go to the exercise part, there is our first notebook, the one corresponding to exercise one. Okay. Now, um, let's discuss how you can make use of this tutorial here, of this notebook. This funny file ending, by the way, that stands for Jupyter Notebooks. Let's click it. And then you should basically get a preview 
of a notebook. Let me quickly scroll down. It's much like the welcome to collaboratory notebook we've been playing with before, a mix of explanation, code, and results. Python primer number one, we'll go through some basic as the header is telling you. And you see this typical structure of blocks, headers, codes. I was deleting all the results here, so no result yet, but you can easily produce the results from the code by running it, as we will do very shortly. All right? So that is our task for today. Question is, how can you follow along? How can you make use of that? Watching the video obviously is one opportunity. I think there are three options. The easiest one would be you use this batch here, open in Colab. If you made your piece with Colab, if you plan to use Colab, every exercise will have this batch. Uh, directly clicking it somehow does not work for me, but if I right click that batch and then go to link in a new tab, that's basically opening the notebook in my Google Colab account, and then I could take it from there. Takes a little while. Let's check what's going on here. There we go. By the way, should you use Colab, Google will constantly remind you to try out the dark theme. That sounds a bit Star Wars like. The dark theme was that. Um, it's just the coloring of the background as opposed to the text and the code. And should you be keen on exploring this dark theme, uh, let me show you. You'll basically find it right here under settings. I note that my picture is hiding that. In the upper right part of your web browser, you should see a little wheel here next to your profile picture, where when you move your mouse over that, you have the option to open the settings. And once you open the settings, you should get this dialog settings for the site, the editor, Kula Pro. Nice thing, but not available for us in the Europe. It's currently only offered in the US. Hopefully they make that available to Europe and other regions of the world as well soon. I wanted to show you this theme, light theme. Let's change to dark. There you go. And then everything looks slightly different. And should you have seen peer students doing some programming, Probably that was the type of picture you have seen, dark background, white or white-ish font, color. Yeah, I mean, there is, I guess there is some research telling us that that's more convenient for the eye when we do programming, but my speculation is that it just looks a bit cooler. Anyways, uh, feel free to try that out if you wish. So now you have your notebook open in Colab, and you can play with that, meaning you can change it whenever you like. That you could not do directly on GitHub. GitHub will not allow you to change the notebook directly, and it will not allow you to run the code, which is the most important bit. Reading, you can, but nothing else. And that is not how I want you to use this notebook. Now that you've opened it in Colab, everything will work fine. I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Let's find our way to some of the coding cells or why not just entering a new coding cell? Let's do so here and now I have a new code cell and I can write some Python code like declaring a variable X, assigning it some value five, declaring another value for a variable Y, assigning it some value, let's say four, and then doing a little trivial computation, printing out the result of X times four, for instance. And then I can run that getting some security warnings. It's loaded from GitHub, not authored by Google. Yeah, be assured that I do not introduce any viruses or malicious code in my notebooks. So it should be safe to run these notebooks. And then we have already seen before that it might take a little while for this to complete. And finally, we get the result, which is 20. Wow, who would have thought? But the point was really to, um, to indicate now we can use the notebook in the right manner. We can play with it, we can run the code, and that is what you need as well. You need to be able to run your code.
pull up would be one way to do that. You can make changes. You can make annotations. So for instance, uh, let me add some text, new text cell, and maybe I want that before my, my code. This is an example showing a simple, simple multiplication in Python. Just to sketch how you could annotate that, or maybe you want to also annotate the code using comments. We can do that as well, obviously. I just can, after a line, for instance, use the hashtag to indicate that's a comment. This bit, although it's a code cell, I don't, non I don't want the Python interpreter to look at it. It should just ignore it. Um, here we declare a variable x and give it the value 5. I don't expect you to annotate your code or my code that diligently, but my point is you can change that in any way you want. One thing is important though, if you make changes, by default, whatever you do here is not stored. It's not saved. And you have to make sure that if you use Colab in that way, you go to the Adams repository, you open the notebooks you'll find there in Colab, you work with them, you make changes, you write some comments to better make use of them, you are responsible for saving them somehow. And obviously there is a file menu which would allow you to do so, offers various options. We have save a copy in Drive, by using Coolup, you need a Google account, so you also have access to Google Drive. There would be one option, saving your modified notebook to your Google Drive account. That is a good idea. If you really want to use Coolup, then the easiest way to get data into Coolup and out of, data, uh, out of Coolup is to put that data into Google Drive. For instance, if I share some data file with you, and I will do so soon, then if you use Colab, you will need to load that data files in order to work with them. And the easiest way to do so, I believe, is to put them on your Google Drive. That's one option. Or you can also download the code, the notebook, and store everything on your computer. If you don't want to use Google Drive for that, that's equally fine. Just you have to make sure this file is stored after you changed it. Otherwise, all your changes will be lost. All right, so that is one option. And again, the easiest way, if you want a minimum amount of hassle with setting up your computer and worrying about your Python infrastructure. There we go. We can safely leave that. Another option is that you set up your computer. And in that case, one way would be to just download this file and copy it to your machine and then use the notebook on your machine. All right, so how do we do um, this bit? We have the notebook here open in GitHub. And uh, honestly, I'm sure there are, there are better ways to do it, but um, one possibility would be the following. Uh, you have a presentation of your notebook here. It looks quite proper, just so that you can't really run the coding bits. That, you see, I, I can't really, I, well, I can click here, but I can't run this code. That GitHub will not allow me because there is no Jupyter server in the back interpreting these programming statements and then executing them. That doesn't work. What you can do, uh, here you have a, the option to view this file, not in the formatted way, but as a raw text file. A Jupyter Notebook is nothing but a raw text type file. If you click raw, you can see that. Uh, looks quite bizarre, I know. That's actually a JSON file, but uh, not to worry. If you look closely, some parts will look a little bit familiar. We have, for example, here this enumeration. So in a nutshell, 
it's the actual content of the file plus a lot of, of instructions. And these instructions, we need the proper software, the Jupyter server, to make sense of. Somewhere down, if we keep scrolling, would be also some coding cell. Here, for instance, you see something like cell type code, execution count, okay, and then actually that's a bit of code that you might have noticed earlier on, but, but not to worry. What I'm trying to say is just, that is the notebook, and what you can do is you click, if you're a Windows user, control A for highlight everything, and then copy the whole bit to your clipper. And that works equally on, on Mac. The shortcut is a little different. And I'm not a Mac user and don't know much about Mac. So please make sure just to um, do whatever you have if you're using a Mac computer. So I copy everything. And now I have the full notebook stored in my clipboard. All right. And um, probably if you use your own machine to run the code and install everything on your machine, you will also want to create a little folder on your machine where you put everything that belongs to Adams. I've simulated that as well. I've created a little folder here somewhere on my machine, Adams exercises. It lives in my download folder. You put it wherever you like. Maybe you're using some cloud drive where you want to store everything, whatever you like. And now here in this folder, I could basically create this or recreate this notebook. To that end, I'll just, uh, well, sorry, I have a German Windows, by the way. So should you not speak German, then um, it might be a little hard to make sense out of these commands. Essentially, I'm just creating a new text file here. That's what I'm doing. I'm creating a new text document. That text document, I'll give a name like x1. And what's important is that we don't want the file ending txt here. Now we don't want because then our Jupyter server would not recognize that as a Jupyter notebook. And the proper ending, that's something you need to remember, is i pi for Python and nb for notebook. i pi nb. And then I get a little warning which tells me, oh dear, you are entering the you are you are changing the file ending from txt to something else. Are you sure? Yes, we are very sure. This is exactly what we do. So uh, just a guess here. All right, and now we have a little Jupyter notebook, which is unfortunately yet empty. So next thing is we open that. I I right-click it and then open it with my favorite text editor. You could just open it with, with Notepad or whatever is the default text editor on your computer. If you open it, um, you basically have an empty file. And in that empty file, you just paste everything that you previously copied from GitHub. And that's it. You save that. Done. Now everything should work just fine. Not the most convenient way, I admit. I did only a quick search for other ways to, to download the notebook, but uh, apparently all other ways that I could quickly identify involve some other software, which then adds also complication. If you know better ways to get the notebook on your machine, please let me know, or please let all of us know and share your recommended approach in our Moodle forum. At least this one should work. Okay, now we have our notebook here, X1. Next thing is we need to start our Jupyter server. I'm using Anaconda. So I would go to Anaconda and then you can use the navigator or you can just use the command prompt. The command prompt is a little quicker. So I use that one, but feel very free to use the graphical user face interface if you like that better. Okay, to save my, save a little bit of time, I would now first of all navigate to the folder in which I store my notebooks, which in my case is downloads. And there we have, sorry. And there we have Adam's exercises, CD, that is just standard Windows command, change directory. Again, if you do that on Mac, 
The commands might be a little bit different, but I need to leave that up to you figuring out how that works. And in fact, it's not mandatory that you first navigate to your target folder. You could also do that once you've started the Jupyter server. Maybe that's even easier if you're feeling a little bit shaky with a command prompt or interacting with your computer by typing in commands. One note of caution, by default, if you use Anaconda, you will work in the base environment. That's the environment, which is the default environment. It's pre-configured and you have access to that when downloading Anaconda. I hope you had a look into the documents I was sharing on Moodle and read up, read up a little bit on, on Anaconda or package managers in Python. If not, I invite you to do so. You do not need it right away, but if you use your own machine, if you use your own machine, machine, computer, sorry, if you use your own machine and want to do something serious with it, like working on the assignment later on, it's a good idea to understand what a package manager like Anaconda does and how to use it. In a nutshell, the idea is that you create a sandbox of a given version of Python. I'm using, for example, Python version 3.7. Maybe you use 3.8 because I think there is this newer version is out now. But not only the version of Python matters, also all the, the libraries that you use in your code, scikit-learn, numpy, pandas, whatever, they change over time, they are advanced, and you want to make sure that your code that is compatible with a certain version of a library or Python also works with other versions. And the idea of this package manager is you create your sandbox where you have Python in some version and all the libraries that you need in a given version, and you know this sandbox with these libraries and Python and your own code works. It's a sandbox where everything works properly. And if you want to update to a newer version of Python or a newer version of some package later on, you can do so. But before that, you create a new sandbox where you install all the libraries in their most recent version. And then you check whether your code is compatible with the new version of some library. And if it does, wonderful, that's nice. But if it doesn't, you always have access to your old sandbox with the running and working code. And these sandboxes are called packages. And Anaconda is one popular example for a package manager in Python that you can use for this purpose. You don't need to do that. You can just start working in the base environment where basically Anaconda has created this sandbox for you and you use the version of Python that's installed there and you use the packages that are available there and everything works for the first couple of exercises. At some point, you need to extend that a little bit. And at that point, it would be good if you spend a little bit of time on learning about this, this ideas of package managers in Python and what Anaconda actually is, is about. I, for example, um, have created an environment for the course to make sure that my code runs properly. And I would now activate that environment. Surprisingly, it's called Adams. And now if I start my Jupyter server, it will basically use this sandbox. But you don't need to do that and everything should work properly with the base environment, at least for the first exercise where we don't use many packages. Definitely not something exotic. Um, Jupyter Notebook, that is the command I now need to key in. Jupyter Notebook, it will start my Jupyter server after a little while. We'll open a web browser where I get the front end of the Jupyter server that now runs on my local machine. And because I was navigating to the folder where I created my exercise file earlier on, I see this file right here. Otherwise, I have some options to navigate in Jupyter server here uh, changing directories, but it's always relative to the root directory. So you can, from the root directory in which you launched your Jupyter server, 
you can go into deeper child directories, but you can't sort of move out of that. Anyways, let's open our Jupyter server notebook here by clicking it. And finally, there we are. You might also get this warning, which in English would say kernel not found. Oh, it's actually, <laughs> sorry, it's actually English. Uh, couldn't find a kernel matching Python deep learning. Please select a kernel. Uh, you know, that basically has to do with these environments uh, for which the notebooks were created. And somewhere down in the notebook, this environment, deep learning, which was the one by Johannes, I believe, is still stored. Not to worry, uh, you will have an availability uh, and um, a drop down list here to change that. PyCharm VHB product, that's one of my environments. I also have PyCharm Adams, that's one I'm using now. Uh, and you should also have an environment, Python 3 here, or a kernel, Python 3, and that will be just fine. As long as you don't create your own environments with Anaconda, you should always be able to use this Python 3 environment and everything will work out just fine. There we are. And you've seen that I was just using a default kernel of Python 3 on which now my notebook is running. And as before, now we have our Jupyter server, we have this control here that we can make use of adding new cells, cutting cells, moving cells up or down, running cells, looks slightly different from Colab, but um, the concept is very, very similar. And if you are happy with one, if you're happy with Colab, you will find your way through Jupyter and vice versa. So moving from one tool to the other is really easy. That is the second option. One last comment, and then we really start with the exercise. If you, if you are more advanced with GitHub or you are ready to invest some time to get acquainted with GitHub, there would be a, a much better way to, to, to get this, this notebook to your machine. Let me go back to GitHub. That's the raw view um, of the notebook. So this is for the GitHub Git experts here, you could just fork that notebook, but if you are such an expert, you will know that. That would be a much better way. You fork that notebook, meaning that you sort of copy it into your own GitHub repository, and then you work from there. You will probably have cloned your repository to your machine, then you make changes on your machine. You can push these changes to your GitHub repository, and what would be uh, superb if then, if you made some cool change to these exercises, maybe extended them, you could send me a pull request so that I would have an opportunity to maybe enhance the notebook with your modifications. If you did something that you think that's, that's, that's a nice addition, or you introduce some new examples, coding examples into the notebook, which you think, well, others might benefit from that as well. That's something that's missing that should be added. Kindly let me know. That would be awesome. And uh, using GitHub would allow some easy workflows to basically collaborate on the notebooks. But of course, that's not your key job. Your job is not to make exercises. But um, I know that there are typically some students in the course who are very good with Python and are a little bit bored with the easy exercises and maybe you would enjoy extending these a little bit if you want uh, appreciate it if not not to worry so yeah by learning how github works there are better ways for sure to get the files to your machine creating your own fork of the file and then working in your repository version of that file and that would be the the ideal option maybe, but you need a lot of understanding about the infrastructure to use that version. And now we have three versions, use Colab, just copy and paste the file that I share via GitHub to a file on your machine and start from there. Or for the Git experts, you just fork the file and work with your own version. There we are. And that is it for 
the infrastructural bit, we can now really get started with our first exercise notebook and see what's in there.